Jump in. Right there, I got it to 
restore. It's a prototype. They, I don't even think this button ever came out. I got this at the Paramount Company store on the lot. You know, they had a group of pins, and I said, oh, what are those pins? They said, oh, these are prototypes. These weren't even produced. So I bought this one pin. It's got the Star Trek logo on it, and it says fully functional. And uh, I stood up for Brent Spiner on the show. Now, Stan, if y'all know what Stan is, we are the second team that calls in after the stars rehearse, and then they, they put the marks and uh, set the camera angles on us and do the focusing of the camera. Well, anyway, Brent loved that pin. I would wear that on the set, fully functional. And uh, he pointed it out one day to Patrick Stewart. You know, he really liked that pin. But there's other pins on there. There's pins where I was uh, at the uh, Robert Kennedy uh, 25th anniversary of uh, Star Trek. It was a tape show, you can see I'm in there in the audience. And uh, all the incidents that happened from that. I hope I don't go into a rambling thing like I did last night on uh, my show. Uh, but all this of my life is coming to a head now in Detroit. I'm up against some very powerful people. I'm up against the Detroit Police Department, uh, politicians, judges, all like that, over my life in uh, Detroit. I can't be quiet anymore. I have to come out. I have to talk about it. So this year, I've started Debbie's Validation Tour. I want some of these stars that I work with to validate me, to say, yeah, I remember David. I remember David. Because they knew me as Carl David, and now I'm Debbie David. But the important part for me is the word David. The name David, my mother gave to me. She changed our family name to David so I would have a biblical name. All my brothers had biblical names. Uh, Mark, Joey, who was named after my dad, Joseph. My mother's name was Mary, Marigold Ivory Anderson. And uh, everybody called her Mary. And uh, my dad was Joseph. And so Mary and Joseph had this baby on March the 3rd, 1955. It was a special day in a lot of ways. It was the day my dad opened his John Deere store in Shelbyville, Kentucky. And uh, it's the day I was born. And nine months later, I'm playing baby Jesus in the patty. And apparently, from what Miss Chipman and Miss Cleveland told me over the years, uh, they, uh, I, when the shepherds came up in the pageant, Christmas pageant, I started laughing. And then the shepherds froze. They didn't know what to do. Oh, well, baby Jesus laughed. And then the audience laughed. And everybody laughed. And then as every, the wise men came up and everything, supposedly I laughed. And I laughed at the whole thing. So, they, they told me the story over the years, different ladies, different things, and uh, I always uh, think that. And then I ended up playing Jesus a few times. I started growing my hair out long to play Jesus as Godspell in Kentucky. Now, uh, uh, I played Jesus several times. I swore to my dad in front of the glass, stained glass window, in the church, Methodist church. I grew up in the Methodist church. And I had perfect attendance all 17 years of my youth. Until I went to college, I had perfect attendance at school. And I'm the only one, the only one, in my high school senior class who had perfect attendance all 12 years. So I said the Pledge of Allegiance more than anyone else, mathematically proven, by me being there every day. I said, liberty and justice for all. Now, I had to bring, you know, anything into a Star Trek convention, but 
I need people to validate me in Hollywood that I work with. Now, there's several people that don't really owe me this favor, but I'd like to talk about them right now, real quick while I got the time. So, I have these posters here that I'm making as homemade title cards. I'll be out there making the rest of them this afternoon at my table. I have gifts to give away. I have Star Trek uh, cards from the Star Trek collection that I'll sign for you with my gold uh, pen. And I'm not trying to sell them. I'll give them to you if you'll let me just talk to you for a moment. You know, at my table out there. I won't have time to tell everything about this. Uh, anyway. But, and yet all I want you to do for me is subscribe to my channel, my YouTube channel. I'm, I've become a YouTube channeler and I've been documenting my life in videos since the late 70s. I have video on different mediums and everything else. A lot of it has been taken away from me now. And I don't know what to do. I'm trying to recollect my artwork. They're trying to get my artwork too. I have artwork from different artisan and everything like that. Now when the police pulled me over, and got me into this trouble. I told them in LA, I'm an actor, I'm on Star Trek. They didn't believe it, they thought I was crazy. It started me down the road. I need some of these stars that I, back then, I, I called out. I said, oh, well, uh, ask this star, just ask this star if they know me. And supposedly they asked them, but they said they didn't know me. I don't know. Now, I spent 30 years in Hollywood. I owned a nightclub there. I owned a restaurant and cafe. I uh, was in a lot of different TV shows. I've been over 90 shows, mostly as a background or extra. But being a union actor, you get up close with the uh, stars in all the movies. Like I spent an afternoon staring at a beautifully uh, uh, wonderful woman who's nude from the waist up. I'm standing right in front of her for the whole afternoon while we filmed Death Becomes Her. Isabella Rosalini picked me to stand right in front of her because in the scene that, that was required. And all these, and then that's how I learned about bedbugs was through Isabella Rosalini. And now we're fighting bedbugs uh, here in uh, Detroit like crazy. Like, it, it, took over my life last year, and it's part of the reason I have to speak out now. The other reasons I have to speak out now is because of COVID. I've lived through two years of COVID, and everybody else has too. And I might have died just like any of y'all might have died. And it's given me the courage to go ahead and speak out. I haven't seen my children since 1996 because I became a woman. And back then, that was a social deviant. I was mentally disturbed in the eyes of uh, psychiatrists and, 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 and doctors. And they hadn't written the rules that they go by now for transgender people or for even LGBT people. Now, I don't consider myself gay, but you know, I get thrown into that category a lot. To me, it's not about that aspect of this. I'm Debbie now for reasons of my own. I've always been female in my head. I kept it to myself, I kept it in my heart as long as I could. Once my wife left me, I knew I didn't want to be with another woman. I didn't want to be with, uh, uh, I didn't want to have any more children. I didn't think God would want me to have more children. And, uh, <coughs> I became Debbie. I lived a life as Debbie. Now, I'm talking about this church in Shelbyville. I'm not allowed to go back there now. But the Methodist Church has come farther than a lot of your major denominations towards accepting LGBT people. And this is my goal, to make my hometown church accept me and let me come back to it. Now, I swore in front of that glass of Jesus knocking on the door to my dad that I wanted to live my life as an artist. And he fixed it so I can. They can't take it away from me, nobody can. I am gonna talk about this artist. Now, when I 
lost my club in L.A., and I ended up pretty much living in a shelter in L.A. I was paying the storage on my artwork and stuff, but I didn't have a place to live. I ended up on the street. I was living in a shelter. One day, I'm walking down the street, and at the Egyptian theater, they had this movie playing time after time with Malcolm McDowell and Mary Seaver. Now, I saw that and it said, live in person, Malcolm McDowell. So I went back to my uh, place, squirreled some money away at the shelter, got enough money to buy a ticket to that thing. And I went in and I sat on the front row and watched time after time. And afterwards, Malcolm McDowell came out. And I sat on the front row and I didn't know if he'd recognize me or not. The reason I'm a blonde is because of Malcolm McDowell. I stood in for him on Generations. He played Dr. Soren. And anyway, we refilmed the ending of that movie and I was out there in the Valley of Fire in the desert. One of the uh, hairstyles said, hey, uh, they had me wearing this blonde wig, like a dead poodle on my head out there so they could get the light reading off my head for Malcolm McDowell. And, uh, one of the hairstyles said, listen, if you come to the room tonight, I'll uh, blonde your hair, and Paramount will pay for it. I said, yeah, I, I've never been blonde. I'll try that, you know. And so I became a blonde to stand in for Malcolm McDowell. The next day on the set, he saw what I'd done, and he said, oh, uh, you did that for, you know, why? And I said, yeah, I'm tired of having a dead poodle on my head all day in the sun. And he said, uh, and I, so I asked him, I said, why did you decide to make Dr. Soren a blonde? And Malcolm McDowell turned to me and said, because blondes have more fun, darling. And, uh, and so I kept blonde. I started getting different roles back in Hollywood. I started doing plays and I would be playing the bad guy or the sinister guy just because I changed my blonde. I started, my career changed completely because I became blonde. I stayed blonde the rest of my life. Blondes do have more fun. But anyway, when I was at this movie, time after time, I sat on the front row, I didn't think Malcolm McDowell would recognize me. And then I said, um, uh, they had a question and answer period. And I didn't ask them a question either. I was afraid to. And then it ended and I walked out the door. I'm about 50 feet outside the theater and I feel a finger on my shoulder. I turn around, and it was Malcolm McDowell's uh, handler, assistant, or whatever. And he said, Malcolm wanted to speak to you. Are you talking to him? So I go back in, I go backstage, Malcolm McDowell, he hugs me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you come up to my ranch in Ohio, you know, and all this stuff. I went out that afternoon. I went out to my storage unit. I scrolled through my storage unit. I got some antiques and collectibles and some Hollywood memorabilia. I took it into Hollywood. I sold it to different stores. I got enough money to get out of the shelter into a hotel. And I thought, if Malcolm McDowell remembers me, I don't have to go down this road. And I went from there to moving to Detroit, meeting the Star Trek fans that I met here at Marscon, and we ended up getting married as soon as the Supreme Court allowed it, and uh, that's where I am now. What's the time? One nineteen. What? Twelve nineteen. One nineteen. Oh, it's only nineteen minutes in. Yes. All right. I don't want to ramble off like I did last night. And suddenly it was over, and I hadn't said anything I want to say. I'm rambling now, I know, and I appreciate y'all coming. Uh, now, this Debbie Queen of the Underground, I want the B-52s to validate me, too. Now, how would I get these stars, how would they ever hear about this? They won't. I've been doing this, you know, for six months now on my YouTube channel, but I only get like 30 views of anything. I do these long three-hour and 33-minute uh, uh, broadcast 
of like parties or just me talking and stuff. Now, uh, I've been on more than science fiction. I've been on more science fiction movies than just um, Star Trek. I did Babylon 5. I worked on Star Wars. I worked on uh, Stargate. Uh, I'm, you can see me in uh, DS9 and you know Voyager, of course. I'm Ensign Russell on uh, Next Generation, but I also played Klingons and Romulans, all the aliens I pretty much did. Like Michael Westmore put the Klingon neck thing on me, I mean the Cardassian neck thing on me, up in his studio. And uh, we went over there to Rick Berman's office to get our approval on that. Same thing with Chakotay's uh, Maori tattoo Indian look that Chakotay has. That was first put on my face by Michael Westmore. We walked over to Rick Berman's office, sitting there in front of a, a panel of uh, Ron Moore and uh, Jerry Taylor. Rick Berman sitting there. Dave Rossi, his assistant, walked us into the room. And uh, they asked, uh, Michael Westmore explained the look that thought that Chakotay. So Rick Berman asked me, uh, what do you think? As an actor, would, would an actor feel good in that? And what about putting it on and the process of putting it on? What did you think of that? And I said, oh, yes, sir. It, it works very good, sir. I, uh, uh, I think it, it, the actor would do well with this. And Rick Berman goes, sir, sir, why are you calling me sir? Am I, do I look that old and everything? And then Jerry Taylor, she said, uh, he's just trying to show you respect, you know? And, but, but after that, that Rick Berman was always nice to me. He would come up to me and say hi or say something to me when he was just walking across the set. And so, you know, it, it gave me a little extra cash on the set. I really appreciated uh, uh, Rick Berman. Uh, he, uh, he was the king of Star Trek at that time, boy. And uh, I, I have all these memories. I, I like to talk to Mary Lou Penner someday. Y'all ever heard about her and her brain, Mary Lou Penner? You know Mary Lou Penner from Taxi, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, she apparently can remember every day. Like, she can, you can ask her about something. She'll say, oh, that was a Thursday, and my mom was cooking, stuff like that. I'm not like that. But I'm something. I remember a lot. I can remember very young things. I was reading at three years old. I remember in the first grade the teacher saying, You're you daydreaming, or are you daydreaming or you're not paying attention. It was because I had to think of something else because they were teaching them A, B, C, D, you know, teaching them the letters of the alphabet, and I was already reading like Shahrazad, you know, a thousand Arabian nights and stuff. Uh, that's why, you know, it's like I, I came up with these concepts like in the second grade and the teacher go, what, what are you doing? And so I, they've been testing me all my life. And, you know, I, I'm tired. Of, I, I can't go to school anymore. I'm 67 years old. I just turned 67 on March the 3rd. I'm a Pisces. It's the end of the age of Pisces. Did you all know that? Yeah. I, and that's something I can prove in a book. Now, in uh, musical hair, um, um, they say it opens with the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And uh, it is. It, that's the next age. But Pisces is the last age. That means we've gone through all 12 ages now in the history of mankind and creation of the planets and everything. So uh, Pisces, I'm Pisces, uh, and Pisces rising. Uh, I said I was born on March 3rd, 1955. And so there's not going to be an exact date of the end of Pisces, but I've decided in my own head that the end of the age of Pisces is when I die. Because I've just decided that. Now, in my own head, I live in it. 
and everybody does. And in my own head, in my own universe, there are no coincidences. There's just doesn't exist. It's my number one rule. Now in the Screen Actors Guild, they have a number one rule of don't work without pay, without proper pay. You don't work, you don't act. That's your number one rule. In the food handling safety industry, in that certification you have to have to own a restaurant like I did in LA, the number one rule is any doubt, throw it out. So if you thought about it, that cheese might not be good, you have to throw it out because you thought about it. Because you can't make somebody sick, you know, you can't give them a foodborne illness or something to kill them. My number one rule is there are no coincidences. I don't believe all the people I've met in this world, politicians, kings, queens, uh, um, actors, you know, uh, uh, that I've lived with, that I've known, and I, you know, from my best friends. There's other things like when I lived over a year in Rome, I lived for a year in Italy. I lived couple of months in Milan. I worked at uh, the San Remo Music Festival one year. I did a Danone, uh, which is what they call Dan and Yogurt, Italy. I think it even started there in Italy, Danone. And uh, I did a Danone Yogurt commercial. People stopped me on the street in Rome. And I do the little catchphrase that I did. I played this like Gomer Powell, American Soldier. Uh, Burt Lancaster, I, I got to meet Burt Lancaster, and uh, Burt Lancaster uh, was one of his last movies, I think his next to last movie, it was called The Kelly Laurel Story, and uh, I was working at Chinichita on another movie, the tap, look for my water, anyway, uh, I was working on this other movie in uh, Italy, Chinichita, that's their one big old movie studio in Rome. And they came in, they said, we got Burke Lancaster coming in to the airport. We want an American to greet him at the airport. So we, we want you to go there. And they had a car for me and a driver and everything. I said, oh, that'd be great. Oh, thank you. So I go to the airport and we go and there's Burke Lancaster. Now, Burt Lancaster, all my life, I had a thing for him, you know, as a little kid. I remember watching the movie Trapeze with him and Toby Curtis, and they're, they're circus performers, they're trapeze artists. And uh, Burt Lancaster plays the catcher. He's the one who catches Tony Curtis, the trapeze artist, in the film. And there's this whole trick they're trying to do, this one trick that's almost unattainable, and that's kind of what the movie plot about. And I always had this, you know, thing for Burt Lancaster growing up and never thought I'd meet him or anything. So here I am, I go to the airport and there's Burt Lancaster. Now he's, uh, he was, you know, and he was old then, but he still moved with this like grace. I and mean, he was Burt Lancaster, right? He was, and he, he was so steady and exacting and everything. Anyway, he had this police with him, uh, a leather case. And he kept it to his side. And I kept saying, do you want me to carry that for you? No, no, I'll keep it. And then when we got in the car, I said, you know, and when we got to the hotel, you know, you know I went up. And then I, I spent, you know, I would go and get him during the day and stuff and get him to different shops and stuff. And we, you know, didn't become friends, but we were close. He told me stories and stuff. Now, when they sent me down there, they sent me with a pack, a carton of Camel cigarettes. Camel unfiltered cigarettes. And uh, the old pack, Turkish and domestic blend, uh, choice quality on the side. And I had read this book uh, by J.L. Robbins called uh, 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 Still Life of Woodpecker. I don't know if anybody in here ever read that book. Still Life of Woodpecker. And in that book, a guy in prison puts himself into the world of a camel cigarette pack. There's images, and people have talked about this for ages, of there's a girl in, in the camel that you can see, and there's a lion in the camels, 
fur and the way that the artists made the fur on the camel. And there's this whole world, you know, there's a pyramid over there and thing. And so in the book, this prisoner, he gets into this world of the camel cigarette pack. And so between that, so when I give the carton of cigarettes, they told me the attachment to the set. And I, so I had them to Burt Lancaster. I said, they said they give you this. It's in your contract. And he said, oh, I, I don't, that hadn't been for years. And I don't smoke anymore. You keep them, kid. So I did. I kept them. I took them back to L.A. And I put that card behind another piece of artwork I had up on a mantle, leaning on the top of the mantle. And I put that card in the cigarettes there. And anytime somebody would be at my house or a party or something, they say, you got a cigarette? I said, well, yeah, I do. And I give them that, and I tell them the story of where they came from, how I got them. And I did that for years. I mean, they were very stale when I had them. And you had to be desperate on a nicotine that did that yet. But my friends would, you know, make some more cigarettes. But the packs of cigarettes, I cut out the camels, and I cut out the trains. And I put them into my collages. Now I did 10 collages where that little camel is in my artwork. And one of those pieces of artwork won best in show at the LA Jury ex Exhibit at the Watts uh, Art Gallery at the Watts Tower in Los Angeles. And uh, in that collage is uh, images of uh, James Dean, Dennis Hopper, uh, other actors I worked with and, and knew stories about. Uh, I knew a lot about James Dean through Dennis Hopper. Now, Dennis Hopper is my distant cousin. And I keep talking in my videos now and in the storyline about the people I'm fighting in, uh, in uh, Detroit that we came down here on the shuttlecraft, Dennis Hopper. And I named my shuttlecraft in the storyline of Ensign Russell doing these conventions and, and blending real life into the stories and the actors I'm trying to get word to. I'm using my character of Ensign Russell. That's why it says Debbie David as Ensign Russell because it was Carl David as Ensign Russell. I want the world to know I'm Debbie David now. I'm tired of hiding. I can't anymore. They're going to kill me otherwise. My family doesn't want me to speak out. I'm going to speak out anyway. I want to go to my hometown. I got property. I got a guitar that I want Dwight Gill to take care of, and I want to make a movie about it. It's a fantastic uh, story of an art director who was gay, had to hide it in the 40s, 50s, and 60s in Hollywood, uh, and he had this guitar made for by Manuel Reyes, uh, senior, uh, the ultimate, the Stradivarius of Luthiers is my Ray Sr. His son still makes uh, guitars in Cordova. They're very expensive. It's, there's a waiting list. You can't get them. And I have one of those guitars that was given to me by Carl Browner, the art director of The Lucy Show, and he's the art director of uh, Get Smart and uh, Crazy Like a Fox and Paint Your Whack in the movie. That's how I started working for him. Uh, I got him to sing, uh, they called the Wind Mariah at a party at Carl Brander's house. And uh, after I finished singing it, he said, uh, they said, yeah, did you know Carl was the art director on Painter Wagon? And I said, no, I didn't know. I said, well, what'd you think? He goes, not very good. And uh, at the end of the party, I was helping him clean up and he noticed me and then I came over by him. He was in a wheelchair already by then. And he said, uh, young man, would you work for me? And I said, yeah, sure. And I didn't know what he meant. And uh, that led into me moving into the house and taking care of him for three years. And he became my mentor. He taught me about art direction. He taught me so many things. He let me live in grace inside Griffith Park. Now, Griffith Park is an amazing place. It's inside L.A. It's in the middle of L.A. But it's 3,600 acres, I think. There are deer living inside River Park, surrounded by L.A., up in the Hollywood Hills. And there's a path up into the mountains that's continuous, up into the Santa Monica area. And these deer will come down, and one morning, come out of the front of Carl Browner's house, there, and it 
more like a Disney movie or something. A Bambi uh, in real life. I saw this group of deers walking down the street in front of Carl Browner's house, heading back into the park. They had walked out of the park into the Hollywood area where like Madonna lives and stuff like that. And uh, they were walking down the street and the buck had like a seven point eight antlers. Now to see that when you're coming out to pick up the newspaper in, in LA, that was just phenomenal. I remember sitting on, there was a park bench that was part of Griffith Park that was like our front yard for Carl Browner's house. We lived in per, inside Ferndale. Another funny coincidence, because now I live in Ferndale, Michigan. Spelled differently, but there's this beautiful park called Ferndale. It's part of Griffith Park. It's a pathway that you walk through. And at night, they shoot these big cannons of water out over the, this canyon to keep it real wet, because they have all these different types of ferns that grow in there. That's why it's called Ferndale, F-E-R-N-D-E-L-O. And that was my front yard. That was my park. The park closed at night, and you weren't supposed to be in it at night. But Debbie, she could walk all the way up to the Griffith Observatory in the middle of the night. And if a park ranger saw me, he'd say, oh, Debbie, are you okay? This is how I live, because of Carl Brown. So one day I'm sitting out there at night and uh, uh, I'm sitting there on the power bench and this dog was there. And I kind of saw it out of the corner of my eyes and I heard it panting and I saw it out of the corner of my eye and I reached over and I pet it like that. And then uh, I heard it panting and it kind of stopped panting and I gave it another little pet. And it did like this on um, me, you know, I want to be petted again. So I looked over at it and I petted it and I realized it's a coyote. It's not a dog, it's a coyote out of your heart. <laughs> so this is how I was living with, with Carl Brown. That's how I got in trouble with the LA police. They came and beat me down one night and took me away. They thought I was a homeless person in the park. They didn't know that I took care of the man in there. They left him all night alone, put me in jail. And that's how it all started, the trouble that I'm still fighting now. It's followed me from LA to Detroit, and now into Ferndale. I can't get anybody helping with it. But I've got it documented, I want you to watch my shows. Now another star I wanna call out right now, and I don't know if this word will get to, to him, but I need his character that he played on Voyager in Star Trek to, uh, to help me, my character, Ensign Russell. I need some future technology to come into the timeline to fix a communicator that I'm trying to communicate with. Now, they've ended the car, so I can't do this deal that I was trying to do. I was trying to get my friend Tracy Kogo in the background of the car. So I started this whole deal and it's gotten me in trouble now. And uh, I'm not gonna be able to fix, it, fix the communicator in time to get Tracy on the car. So I've had to give up on this deal. But I still want this deal with Ed Begley Jr. to happen. I want his character to come into the timeline on my storyline with Ensign Russell. And the reason I want to do that is I want to tell a story about Ed Begley Jr. Uh, right now. And if he hears about it, maybe he'll validate me. He probably won't remember me, because why would he? He's a big star. But we had several interactions when we were filming Star Trek. Now, I would see Ed Begley Jr. around town all the time. He drove a golf cart. Before anybody else was trying to do and save the planet like that, he was a major celebrity that would speak out about greenhouse gases and everything. He converted this uh, uh, golf cart into a uh, uh, road uh, legal vehicle. You know, he put the lights and everything it had to have so he could drive this cart, uh, cart on the street. 
and uh, five minutes, <laughs> five minutes, wow, but time went really fast after that, huh? <laughs> anyway, Ed Bailey Jr., let's be here with him real fast. He came to the set one day. We were on location at the music center. And I had car trouble that morning. And so my wife had dropped me off. Now, when Ed Begley Jr. arrived on the set, he stepped off of a city bus. He rode the bus to our location. So I said, hey, I gotta take the bus home. He knew every route by heart. He knew which route I should take into the valley. He knew all these things. So Ed Begley Jr., he lived this life of, uh, let's save the planet. And I want that to be known to people. I really love him as an actor, too. Now, I love his father. Debbie Reynolds is one of the reasons I'm named Debbie. And I got to tell Debbie Reynolds herself that. She met me as Debbie, too. I, I worked at, uh, I did a play that rehearsed at her uh, studio, and, and she had a Debbie Reynolds studio, and it was a rehearsal hall for actors and stuff. I met her there first, and I told her about the reason I would name Debbie is because of her movie Goodbye Charlie. And I collect Goodbye Charlie things. Everybody I mean, know the movie Goodbye Charlie and Goodbye Charlie, Walter Matthau shoots a guy, he falls off a boat into the water and he gets reincarnated as Debbie Reynolds, a girl. But he's got all his memories as a man. And he's got Tony Curtis. Now oh, I can't finish all the stories. You guys got to watch my channel. I'll put all eventually on this channel, all right? Uh, I need to get a thousand subscribers. Then YouTube will give me an encoder. Then I can do graphics live. I can do uh, cutaways and things. I'll be like a real TV station if I get a thousand subscribers. That's my goal, and that's why I'm here at Mars Time. Now, Tony Curtis, I met doing Last Action Hero. I got to spend an afternoon with Tony Curtis and tell him about me meeting Burt Lancaster and tell him about Goodbye Charlie and why I named myself Debbie. And he was standing there with Little Richard and in, in the scene that we did in Last Action Hero. And uh, so I got to spend the afternoon with Tony Curtis and tell him all my stories because when you're with these stars, they don't want to talk about themselves. They want, they'll turn to me. I remember Michelle Pfeiffer on uh, Batman Returns. You know, we, we had to hold up her skirt. Uh, it was, she had this Bob Mackie gown on in the uh, costume ball scene. You can see me in Batman Returns on the, uh, uh, on the uh, London Clock Tower in uh, the costume ball scene. I'm in a white tuxedo with the uh, thing. Anyway, Michelle Pfeiffer, she would, uh, she would say, well, what's your story, you know, and stuff like that. One day, I'm, I'm holding up the skirt to keep the weight off of her between takes of this heavy beaded Bob Mackie gown that she's wearing. And so they had like four or five of us extras come in there and we pick up the skirt and hold the weight of it off of her between takes. And so we got to know Michelle pretty well in that week that it took to film that thing. So one day, I'm sitting there, standing there, and Michelle says, uh, you know, she looks up at me and I go, you know, they don't call me Big Ben because of this clock on my head. And she cracks up. She goes, oh, that's hilarious. You got to tell Michael. And so she goes over and gets Michael Keaton and he comes over and I said, you know, they don't call me Big Ben because of this clock on my head. Oh, he cracks up. Oh, you got to tell Tim. So Tim Burton comes over. I say, yeah, they don't call me Big Ben because of this clock on my head. And he goes, he rolls his eyes and goes, can we get back to work on my movie? Now, in that movie, I had a speaking part. I was a mayor's assistant. I had three different wardrobes. They came down to my measurements. They made this wardrobe for me. It was a winter scene with penguins and everything. And that now returned a big scene. I'm the mayor's assistant. I had lines. The first day that we're filming, Tim Burton comes in. I didn't see Edward Sisson. I didn't know who Tim Burton was. Didn't know. Here comes this guy with flyaway hair, didn't look very, you know, he's kind of moving funny. I thought he was a production assistant, I didn't know. 
A guy's talking to me when Tim Burton comes into the room. I tell the guy, be quiet. Tim Burton only heard me say, be quiet. He thought I was the one talking. He looked up at me, and then he started talking to us about what we were going to do that day in the scene. It was a rehearsal for our scene, first rehearsal with Tim Burton. We're sitting there, and I'm listening to him. We're sitting at tables, and his assistant, he says something to her. She gets up and quietly moves around outside of the room, comes over and speaks in my head, let me speak to you. She takes me out of the room. Tim Burton doesn't want you in the movie. What? Tim Burton doesn't want you in the movie. I just start crying. Well, what do you mean? That was a $60,000 part I had. He said, well, he doesn't want you in the movie. So I left. She stopped me and she said, listen, uh, this isn't right. I can't get you your part back, but I can throw you in in a you know, a special scene as a, you know, I can get you some work on the movie if you want. I said, oh, okay, I'll take whatever you get. And that's how I got to be the uh, big man in the uh, costume ball scene. Uh, this all ties in with Danny DeVito, me meeting him and working with him on Twins, Arnold Schwarzenegger, me smoking a cigar with Arnold Schwarzenegger in his trailer, me smoking a cigar in the trailer with Clint Eastwood on In the Line of Fire, John Malkovich staring me out of my skin. I've got all these Hollywood stories I want to tell them, but I don't have time. And they might kill me when I get back. Y'all follow what happens to me, please. And uh, love you for coming. If you see me out of the table, I'll give you one of those cards. I know all y'all probably subscribe that we're here today. And uh, I'll put some of this video up on the channel too in the future. And uh, thank you for coming.